Hello, Penelope. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Experiential Anatomy. <laughs> Penelope's here in body and spirit, but she's pretty checked out mentally. She's our mascot. She is. and I don't know if you can hear her purring, but she's no. purring her head off. Hi, Mary Richards. Hi, Lizzie Lasseter. So today's topic is about shoulder stand. Yeah, Sharvin Lasseter. I wanted to ask you about the neck because um, there are differing schools of thought about how high if at all, to prop ourselves when we take this pose. So very basically, what is our, what is the structure of our body tell us about what would be uh, prudent in terms of support? And then how do we know what is enough, what's too much, what's too little? How can we experiment and test that in our own body? So the, the cervical segment of the spine is the most mobile. Mm -hmm. And where does it, it starts like sort of here, right? Yeah, so you can feel a bump at the bottom of your neck. That's C7, T1. Mm -hmm. And then there are seven cervical vertebra that go up, you know, come up to the base of your skull. Mm -hmm. And the fascinating thing about the cervical vertebra is they, they're so differentiated. They have different types of spinous processes and there's so much going on vascularly and in terms of um, nervous system structures in the neck. And I mean, if you think about the neck, it's basically a mobile turret for your organs of perception. That's, that's why we have so much mobility is so that we can take in information. Mm -hmm. And so in Sharvangasana, oh, and here's something, too, that um, I should grab my spine model, maybe. It's, okay, I'll be right back. It's in the yoga room. <laughs> All right. So there are seven vertebra. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And what you're feeling at the base of your neck mm -hmm. is, um, this, is the big spinous process. Mm-hmm. And that's what these are sticking mm -hmm. out off the back. These are called spinous processes. And each one, like C1 doesn't have one. Okay. Because that would block your, you know, your head. Okay. But if you look at two, it has one. And then you go to three and four and five, and they have these, they're almost two footed. Mm -hmm. And then you look at um, six and seven and you can see they're much larger. So two, I'm feeling two really strongly, but then three, four, five are kind of getting lost. Is that normal? Yeah, that's normal because your neck, like your lumbar spine, has what's called a lordosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, it has a concave curve, and it's known as a secondary curve, okay? Okay. So the fascinating thing about... You love anatomy. <laughs> I, I really do. Um, the fascinating thing about the low back and the neck is that those, those curves, you're not born with them. We're not born with them. We're born with a primary curve with mm -hmm. the kyphosis of the upper back and the sacrum, mm -hmm. but the secondary curves of the low back and neck develop in response to gravity. Yeah. So, okay, so when you're just crawling before you're walking, you don't have that yet? Or at what point does that start to develop? Uh, and, and babies start to develop their cervical lordosis as they gain head control. Wow. And we develop a low, a low back curve when we start standing. That's How such a fascinating, that? that's such a, fa yeah, that's such a fascinating developmental piece because that really proves that we sort of, the curves are, are there on purpose to help us stand against gravity as opposed to exactly what we're always doing in yoga, flattening these curves. Right. And so with the neck, the reason why it's more difficult to discern, to feel the spinous processes of C three, four, and five is because they're deepest in the curve. Right. 
Okay, so bring us back to shoulder stand. What okay. does the cervical spine do in shoulder stand? Okay, so um, here's the thing. Your neck's not designed to bear weight. <laughs> it's designed to hold your, you know, your head, the bones of the head weigh about 12 pounds. Throw in, you know, your eyes, your tongue, your brain, your cerebrospinal fluid, you're coming up around 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what, that's what the neck is designed to bear in terms of weight. Um, when we're in shoulder stand, the tendency is to flatten mm -hmm. the cervical curve. And that presents risks to the discs of the neck. Yeah. It can cause them to displace. It also can contribute to compression of the vascular structures and the, the nervous structures, the cranial nerves mm -hmm. and your brachial plexus that mm -hmm. innervates your arms and your hands. So, so a kind of 90 degree neck, is that even sort of, only, only super freaks have a 90 degree flexion. Like, um, so hyper, like I have a, I have, I'm really hypermobile in the neck and I've got a 78 degree flexion. The average person has 50. Whoa. Okay. And so the reason why I personally don't instruct nor practice shoulder stand without blankets is because I want to use blankets to support the natural structure of the neck and to more efficiently take weight into my shoulders mm -hmm. because you know you know a person has insufficient support in the shoulder girdle if they can't speak to you with ease mm -hmm. in shoulder stand and if they can't swallow mm -hmm. you have to be able to swallow and also you can look at the color of their forehead they'll get red mm-hmm so now some, when, some you, mm -hmm. when you teach, where do you start? Like, do you start with four blankets, five, three? I start with three. Okay. I start with three of the striped cotton blankets. Um, honestly, it depends how person, how long the person's neck is. So it is uh, highly individual. Yeah. So I go anywhere from three to five blankets. The thing that I like about the three blanket starting point is that it takes the pressure off of the neck. You don't set the blankets up to push into the neck. Mm -hmm. You use the blankets to fill in the space around it. Mm -hmm. to, you know that you, you understand the distinction that I'm making that yes. you're not rolling up the blankets to create a curve. You're positioning the blankets to receive the curve. Yes, yes. So that the neck goes in the negative space. The, 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 yes. Like the step down is where the neck lives. Yes. And by supporting the natural structure of the neck, you're going to help your students get out of their necks and into their shoulders. Mm -hmm. Uh, five blankets can be really scary for folks because they are so high up and you know, they may not have a very good sense of where they are in space because right. they're upside down and on blankets. So I find that it's actually, it behooves us to start a little conservatively with the blankets mm -hmm. and to move from there. And we want to make sure that, you know, that bony knob C7 T1 that uh, we can palpate with ease we want to make sure that's not digging down. You're not digging a grave with that into the blankets. Mm -hmm. So that necessitates a tremendous amount of engagement with the shoulders. And it's why cooperative pectoralis minor muscles are so important because you need to be able to open the chest. Uh-huh. Okay. And why... Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Okay. And why your rhomboids and your middle traps need to be really strong. Mm -hmm. And most of us, our rhomboids and our middle traps are kind of deranged because of stress. <laughs> because we hold so much tension in our shoulders. 
<laughs> okay, please point with one finger. Where is your deranged rhomboid? <laughs> Forget the posterior view. <laughs> right through here. Uh huh. These are your rhomboids in your middle traps, and they're responsible for retracting your shoulders. And when we're and because we're all stressed and on our computers and sitting too much, what happens to the rhomboids and middle traps? They they're they're chronically overstretched in a position of tension, uh -huh. and they don't know how to fire. And so what happens is the upper traps overwork. Mm -hmm. They're like the sentries at the gate. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, we have to do something. We have to do something. Right. So most people, before they even get into shoulder stand, they need to re-educate how they even use their traps. Wow. Okay, I have two questions. Let me look at the time. Okay. okay. So one, I hope you can answer pretty straightforwardly. So when I'm on my shoulders, when a student is on their shoulders in shoulder stand with three or four blankets, what for you is the ideal place where the back of the head then touches the floor? If we take our hands to our head and just stroke down the back of the skull, mm -hmm. you'll feel um, you'll feel a bony ridge mm -hmm. toward the crown of the head, and you'll be able to feel a bony ridge at the base of the skull. Yes. Okay? If you then drag your fingers down about two inches, mm -hmm. you'll be up the center of the back of the skull. Yeah, I want an I want you on the center of the back of the skull. Okay. Can you feel that? You, yeah. There's like a natural spot. I feel also like two ridges running here, and then there's yes. a divot in between. Yes. Oh, I could have brought my skull in. <laughs> uh, yes, and you can. There's a sweet spot there. Mm -hmm. There's a sweet spot, and it's it's basically Lizzie behind the. I was about to say behind the sphenoid. Okay, so if you right behind the bridge bridge of your nose and down below your eyes. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where it is. It's that's right where it is. Okay. Last, this is so helpful, last. Mary. I just I love talking to you. So my last question that I'm throwing at you completely unprepared, but it's just something I was thinking as we were talking about shoulder stand. Inversions in general, is there any evidence-based medicine or studies or ideas or science that you know about that talks about the benefits of inversions? Because we hear so much in the kind of Eastern mythology idea energetically, and they feel so amazing. But yeah. sometimes I wonder because... I've had the thought before, nobody else does these. Like, it's not that also when you play tennis, you also do inversions or when you go skiing or, I mean, no other sort of sport or physical activity that a lot of people do. It seems pretty unique to yoga. So if it's so um, sort of powerfully wonderful for the human body, why doesn't anybody else, you know, like, are we? <laughs> yeah, not yet. My answer to that is not yet, but that data is coming mm -hmm. uh, uh so the, just some of the general physiological science mm -hmm. behind inversions uh and I, i'm so excited about this um i'm presenting at research symposium uh at maryland university of integrative health in a couple of months uh, a neurological case study that i did uh so i'm really up on my neuroanatomy and uh, things like that right now and uh, I'm so excited about this as a realm of research because you often hear that uh, shoulder stand in particular is good for thyroid yeah. and the like but there's no data that right. corroborates that yet but what I can tell you based on my understanding of physiology and the lymphatic system in particular uh, which relies on fluid mm -hmm. hydraulics to to move lymphatic fluid through the body is that what inversions do for us is they actually can, and I believe this will be borne out with data someday, they can improve our global immunity mm -hmm. because they're facilitating the fluid dynamics of the lymphatic system. Okay. Now, does compression of the thyroid improve things like hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's? I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know. Those biomarker studies haven't been done yet to my knowledge. And believe me, I live on PubMed. Uh, <laughs> I have a, you know, I have a problem. <laughs> it's evident. Uh, all I do is think about anatomy and physiology in the context of yoga. Um, but energetically, if we return, if we hearken to the pranavayu model of yoga, mm-hmm. the five different types of prana, the, the the life force energy in the body, the philosophy behind inversions is that um, we're stimulating the vayus toward balance. Mm-hmm. You know, for example, upon us, the energy of elimination, which resides that corresponds to your pelvic floor, it's always moving down toward the feet. Mm -hmm. So if you flip upside down, well, it's still moving toward your feet. Mm -hmm. And so we're improving resilience Mm -hmm. and helping to, um, you know, remove obstacles. Mm -hmm. And we'll see as, uh, you know, thankfully there are things like fMRIs now, functional MRIs and CAT scans and things. It'll be really cool to see the data someday from a from an MRI with cerebrospinal flow tracking to see if that's what inversions do. <laughs> if we just go way off the geek deep end, way off the anatomy nerd deep end, you know, that's... I can just see a Facebook post from you where you're in headstand with all these wires and things <laughs> Right. It's coming, Lizzie. It's coming. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us where we can find you on the internet, Mary. At maryrichardsyoga.com and on Facebook at A Little Yoga Goes a Long Way. Okay. I'm lizzielassiter.com on Instagram, on Facebook. And all of this type of information, if you're interested in yoga plus anatomy equals movement literacy, please sign up at experientialanatomy.yoga and you'll stay in the loop. Yes. All right, Mary. Namaste. Namaste.